Tonight we'll be discussing manual osteoperforation. This is the second part of a three-part series. We, we began uh, with an introduction to it. We're going to continue it and uh, we have a final presentation in February, I believe. So the idea here is we're going to talk about manual osteoperforation and in order to give you some disclosures, I'm not employed by any dental company. I do not own stock securities or interest in any dental company. And again, um, the, my family members are not employed or own stock. They, they don't either, so we're, we're all safe there. I do consult for other organizations, so I, I do some consulting for Propel, Align Technology, 3M, Ortho Organizers, Henry Schein, Myobrace. And again, I have been compensated in the past for consulting and or evaluating products for the sponsor, including Propel Orthodontics. For my participation in this event, I have received an honorarium from Propel Orthodontics. The opinions expressed in this presentation are my views and may not necessarily reflect the views or policies of the sponsor. The materials provided are for educational use and not to be used for advertising or product endorsement purposes. This presentation has been approved for, for the continuing education credits. No photographs, video, or audio recordings are permitted during the presentation. All right, so again, my name is Dr. Ben Moralia. I practice in uh, Mount Kisco, New York. I have been using the Propel product since it's been available. I uh, would say that's probably maybe five years, going on five, maybe six years. And um, it's, a, it's a great concept. It helps out a lot of the orthodontics that we're doing. And uh, basics are that in order to get the, uh, the bone to remodel faster, well, you'd like to have a higher presence of cytokines. And when you have a, a higher level of cytokines, what you get is a, a better rate of bone remodeling combined with a decrease in bone density. And so the, the drop in bone density, the rate of bone remodeling increasing, those are the two uh, ingredients that make for faster tooth movement. So if you want to look at that little cascade of events, basically for the teeth to move, you need the bone to remodel. For the bone to remodel, you need a, a nice level of cytokine production going on. And uh, all of that comes from the uh, manual osteoperforation in the form of an injury. Uh, so while traditional orthodontics, whether it's brackets, wires, Invisalign, retainers, expanders, whatever you're using, uh, produces a controlled inflammatory response, the microosteoperforation is really a miniature injury. And that miniature injury drives up the cytokine level. The cytokine level increases the rate of the bone remodeling, drops the bone density, and next thing you know, you get teeth moving faster. So the, the steps are very simple. This is a, a wonderfully neat and clean process, and our, our patients have enjoyed reducing their orthodontic treatment time uh, with these techniques. So obviously, you're going to evaluate your treatment area. You're going to have to select sites to perform the microosteoperforations. And um, the majority of that comes from clinical examination and x-ray evaluation. We do begin with chlorhexidine rinse. We like to do uh, two one-minute rinses before each uh, Propel application. And then we are going to use two different forms of anesthetic. The first is topical. And the, the topical anesthetic provides a lot of the anesthetic for the uh, regions we're going to propel. Only in certain areas do we need a local infiltrate. Now, if I'm going to use a local infiltrate over the topical, I choose a carbocane, a non-epinephrine containing, and I will not block. So the idea is if I apply the topical and it's enough, and there are a handful of patients, you know, there's a variety of patients, some of them are not very sensitive at all to these types of things. And since the, the bone is not innervated, you can put topical on the tissue and perforate many patients. Some of the patients are a little more sensitive to the pressure, so we would put the topical anesthetic for a minute or two and then give them a drop of a carbocane. But at the site, we're going to perforate, not necessarily blocking the area. I'd like to keep the teeth responsive. Um, if anything, it's a safety net for, for not getting anywhere near the PDL. So now you have the uh, depth of perforation. Obviously, you're, you're trying to perforate the cortical bone. And uh, we're going to show you what kind of depth we need with a little chart coming up shortly. So now, I, I do have a little summary chart at the very end. But most patients require one to two treatments. Only a complex, extensive type of case might require three treatments. I'm going to show you one of those today. The, um, when you're getting involved with the uh, microosteoperforations, I like to get two to three perforations, uh, mesial and distal. 
to uh, some of the bigger, more uh, troublesome teeth in the arch. I do like to put um, multiple perforations in each arch. I'm usually trying for a dozen in each arch. Uh, most of my technique is to treat the entire arch so the entire case treats quicker. You can use the uh, microosteal perforation technique in an isolated area to maybe go after the single toughest tooth in the arch and, and that's fine. You can use it in individual areas, you can use it across the arch. I tend to use it more for the entire arch. So I'll go first molar to first molar and work my way around looking for a minimum of maybe uh, 12 sites in each arch to feel good about delivering a significant um, amount of uh, cytokine production from the wound we're generating. So the idea is that when you're doing the perforations, the osteoclastic response is 6 to 10 millimeters around that treatment site. So from the site you're perforating, 6 to 10 millimeters, um, that really covers almost a three-tooth range. So the, the good news about covering a three-tooth range is that you really don't have to do in between every single tooth. Uh, obviously, we're trying to perforate in areas where there's bone and not where the roots are. So the idea is if we can't get a perforation because of root proximity or some sort of uh, other reason you might have, sinus, blood vessels, nerves, then the idea would be it's okay not to get into every single interproximal site. So every other interproximal site works beautifully. And if you can get to 12, maybe 15 sites in an arch, you can get some great tooth movement. Uh, so now, uh, the, as far as the depth goes, certainly you have um, a depth anywhere from 3 to 7 millimeters. And I can tell you from hundreds and hundreds of these perforations, most of mine are 3 to 4. So I don't really go to five millimeters that often, and it might be because I'm doing a minimum of 12 perforations in the arch, and I'm getting all the way back uh, to interproximal between first and second molars on some of the cases. So I feel like if I can get to 12, maybe 15 perforations, getting to the first and second molar, and I don't necessarily have to go into five millimeters or more. So my experience is two millimeters at minimum, especially towards the anterior, you can get away with two, but mostly it's three to four millimeters of depth satisfy the case. Now, the the effect of the healing, you know, bone heals in, you know, about six to eight weeks, but the idea is we've got an orthodontic process in place, so we're keeping a controlled amount of pressure on the teeth. So it's almost like continuation of the wound. Um, if you break your wrist, you put a cast on it. It's isolated, it's kind of fixed, the cast comes off six to eight weeks later, your bone is healed. But here, we don't have a cast on the teeth. We actually have either brackets, wires, and or something like a clear liner. So there's a constant and active pressure. It would be as if there was a constant and active pressure on your wrist after you broke it. The healing would be delayed. So the osteoclastic effect might peak in 24 hours, but it's going to be around for 10 to 12 weeks, not eight weeks. So we don't have to repeat the perforations every six to eight weeks. We can do them on a 10 to 12 week interval. So now. Where do you perforate? Well, any, anywhere you can. So the idea is to look around. We're trying to avoid, obviously, nerve and vascular bundles. The goal is to think about, if you, well, certainly if you have any experience placing TADS, the temporary anchorage devices, um, mini implants that are used in orthodontics can be placed in a variety of locations. They're the same diameter. So if we're dealing with 1.6 millimeters of diameter uh, and a depth of 3 to 5 millimeters, anywhere that you could place a TAD, you can place a, a perforation. So buckle tends to be for the lower, okay, the lower lingual I have not performed. Uh, I think that's a little bit tough to get to, but the lower buckle absolutely, and I have done the um, upper buckle and upper lingual on certain cases. So the, the palate does offer a nice uh, area for placement of some perforation, so I use the palate as well. This comes from Dr. Baumgartel. This is um, Dr. Baumgartel is the uh, temporary anchorage device uh, guru, and he does a lot of lecturing there. You might have heard his name before. So he's got a beautiful chart that he shows what kind of depth can be uh, used to perforate that cortical bone. And so the idea is anteriorly a minimum of two, but three is shown here. So for the anterior T, three millimeters is a nice number, and I know the posterior shows five here. And so my experience is that four is plenty. Uh, four millimeters into that premolar area or first molar area tends to be just fine. I haven't had the need to go all the way to uh, five millimeters, and it might be because I'm putting multiple perforations in the arch. I, I think every case I've treated, it's a minimum of 12, but it could be as many as 18 perforations per arch, and we're going to see some of that coming up in a couple of nice cases. 
So the pattern is whatever is whatever the roots allow. You know, if you can put them in a straight line, if it's single file, great. If it's a group of three, if it's a little triangle, can one perforation be placed? Can two be placed? When we're taking a look at the area where to put them, um, I, I tend to be more comfortable going a little more apically. So uh, the idea there is our teeth are tapering. So as the roots are tapering, it opens up more space between them. So if we were to look at this single file run, I tend to prefer the second two. So I'm a, I'm a bigger fan of the apical locations where you have the roots diverging further and there's a little more access. And so the ones that are more occlusally located here, there you have the roots at their widest. You might have a little less room. You know, for me, these are a little tougher to do, so I, I work my way a little bit more apically. But it's really whatever you have. And at the beginning of the case, depending upon the root locations and where the teeth are all placed, if you have opportunity to get one, terrific. If there's opportunity for two, great. It's take what you can get. And if you don't get every site, that's okay too. <clears throat> so the idea is you may have places where the roots are totally converging, there's no access, skip it. Because having a six to 10 millimeter range will give you the opportunity to maybe perforate on each side of an interproximal that's not available. So you're just trying to get um, every other tooth is a good pattern, but take whatever you can get and hit a minimum of 12 perforations per arch to really give you a chance to get these teeth moving. What does it look like? Well, one of the earlier devices looked like this. It had a clear shield and that would basically uh, protect the, the, the manual cutting instrument. Immediately upon perforation, <clears throat> you'll see a little red dot, maybe a little clear ring on the gum tissue. There's not a whole lot to see and within minutes these start to fade. <clears throat> so the idea is once you've done the perforation, the patient can then pretty much head into their orthodontic care and minimal requirements afterwards. So the technique looks like this. If we're using the a single use device, these are one of the earlier models, there's a little light that'll when you set the depth it'll bring you right there. So now you're you're rotating clockwise with gentle pressure. Okay, you can also check your engagement because once you get threaded into the bone a little bit, it won't pull out when you go to pull back on it a little bit. It'll actually be engaged. You then have to rotate counterclockwise to remove it. So the light would give you your indication. If you needed to go three millimeters here, at the moment you got to three millimeters, the red light would come on. The reusable handle is a little newer model, and what happens there is that it's sterilizable, and you're just buying the new tips to put into it. So putting the new tip into it is uh, very simple. You're going to remove it from a sterilized package, insert it, and then obviously <coughs> release it when you're done. Same technique, hold it at a 90 degree angle. You're going to rotate clockwise, applying your gentle pressure, and then you have the line marks on the sleeve indicating your depth of three, five, and seven millimeters, so you can achieve your required depth and then basically rotate counterclockwise to remove. You'll know you're engaged if you try to pull back on it a little bit and you get a tug back, okay? So the latest is the power driver, and who doesn't like a new power tool? So here you have something that just needs to be charged. You could leave it in the smart charger so it's ready to go. And now you have, you're able to secure a tip in the contra angle head. And basically what's happening here is um, you're going to rotate, you'll manually rotate that tip until it fully seats flush and close the latch. So much like you would put a burr in your contra angle in the office uh, to do something to the tooth, here you would put this burr into and then release the latch so it would be fully closed and engaged. Now you're going to press and hold the power button to turn that driver on. You can select the RPM, the recommended setting is going to be high. And then you can select your torque, and the recommended setting for the torque is 15 Newton centimeters. <clears throat> Increasing the torque setting as required to reach the desired perforation depth. So you'll notice as you're using it, if you require a little more torque, it might be more of a lower posterior issue. The maxillary arch doesn't usually require it. The bone's a little bit softer. The lower anterior usually doesn't require an increase in torque. It's really the lower posterior teeth that might require a touch of uh, torque increase to get through that. Now, uh, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to basically position yourself at 90 degrees, and then you'll press the start-stop button, okay? And then, obviously, you'll stop when, you're, when you have your desired depth. There is a reverse direction. You're going to press the reverse direction button, and then that will reverse. The indicator will show you on the screen in reverse, <clears throat> and then you can depress the start and stop button until the, the tip di disengages from the tissue. So basically, you're driving it in and you're driving it out. 
and the forward is in clockwise, and then counterclockwise is out, that's reverse. Obviously, when you're done, you're going to remove the tip and dispose of the tip into a uh, uh, your sharps container. You have two modes, a general and a temporary. The general mode, you press the start-stop button briefly to start rotation, and you press the start-stop button again to stop rotation. The temporary mode, you have to press and hold the button for at least three seconds, and then it'll stop immediately when the button is released. Okay. Now, post-treatment. When the patients come in, the pretreatment is the chlorhexidine rinse. So they're taking the, the chlorhexidine rinse. What we do is, after we're done with the perforation, we administer uh, two extra strength Tylenol. So our pattern has always been to administer two extra strength Tylenol at the time of treatment. And then we instruct the patient that evening, depending upon their comfort level, take another two Tylenol for bedtime, and then in the morning, reevaluate how they're feeling. So the the pattern is very consistent. Um, whether we're doing 12 to 18 perforations per arch, which could be anywhere from 24 to 36 total perforations, our patients take two Tylenol at our office. They do take the two Tylenol for bedtime, but the next day none of them have had to take any after that. So they wake up pretty comfortable. The only little bit of soreness is in the evening where they'll take two more for bedtime. The point of the um, after treatment medication is not to have any of the NSAIDs. So you're trying to avoid the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. The NSAIDs are going to work against the inflammatory response that you're producing. So you're, you're looking for analgesic, meaning pain control, not anti-inflammatory. That's working against what we just tried to deliver. The 10 to 12 week pattern works great. You know, I'll, I'll show you a couple of cases where we used a 10 to 12 week pattern and did uh, multiple perforations per arch to, to keep them moving along. So the basics of your choice is you have single use, which has the little red light okay, at the depth gauge setting in the white band. You have a reusable handle where you'll just be purchasing the tips to add to that, and the handle can be sterilized. And now you have the power driver available, and that's a contra angle that is you know, charged, obviously. And that's a touch of a button, so you just insert the tips to use that uh, technique. Each tip can cut as many as you need to. So if you're using the power driver and you purchase a tip for it, that tip can make the 36 or 40 perforations. If you're looking to get 18 or 20 per arch, the, the tips are, are very sharp all the way through all the perforations. All right, some of the benefits. Well, we do consider it minimally, minimally invasive. It's only a few moments to uh, treat a patient with even 12 to 18 perforations per arch. It doesn't take a long time to do this. Um, we don't really add to the appointment time. It's about five minutes of time. They do the two-minute rinse. We put a little topical. If they need a drop of the carbocane in a few spots, you can go right into the perforations. And the perforations, to go three to five millimeters deep, doesn't take many rotations. And so once you're in, you, ro you reverse, you counterclockwise out. So we haven't found it to be any type of a time-consuming procedure at all. Basically, you can have the um, manual osteoperforation technique, whether you're using braces or aligners. I'm going to share two cases tonight that we used Invisalign on. The recovery time is almost nothing. You know, minutes in the office, the patient leaves. The bleeding stops immediately. You know, once you remove, you get a little tiny drop of the blood, but one rinse later, they're all gone. And then next thing you know, the patients are comfortable by a few hours later with a couple of Tylenol. So you don't have any patient compliance issues with this. It's nice and simple. You schedule a session at the beginning when you deliver your braces and or aligners. And then about 10 to 12 weeks later, you do a second round. Most cases can be treated with two rounds. If you have a case that's a little more complex, you might do a third round, and then you should be fine. So now I'll share two cases with you. One of them was done a little bit ago, but it's nice to, to have like a three-year follow-up on it. So at least three years later, we know he's still doing well. Uh, this is a gentleman named Andrew, 26 years old, came into the office. He was just not interested in wearing braces, and so uh, he knew that we would provide Invisalign care for him. So he has a fairly collapsed bite with an awful arch form and an awful arch width, and he's got tooth number seven trapped behind uh, six and eight there, hiding very nicely. His mid-palatal suture is shaped like a hockey stick. We certainly have every bit of the omega-shaped arch, and so as we look around, it's got plenty of collapse, even in the lower arch. All the posterior teeth are falling in towards the tongue. At 26 years old, he's got all of the wear and tear of a malocclusion on all of the buccal cusps of the first molars there. The lower incisal edges are starting to wear a little bit. And so here we have a complete collapse in the arch form and the arch width. And we would be looking, obviously, to, to utilize clear aligner therapy 
to put all 28 teeth where they belong. The interest for the patient was to do it in the least amount of time possible. And so we obviously offered the micro perforation. And in this case, we ended up using Invisalign as our clear liner choice, and the micro perforation was done with Propel. So he does show up with a, a class one malocclusion on both sides. And so having all those credentials, he fits in to be a great candidate. We take a Panorex and some PAs because sometimes the Panorex isn't enough, but it does show us plenty of opportunity for well, areas to micro perforate. So now if we look at this, here's, an, here's a good site right here where we have uh, number 21 and 22 rather close together. And this would be a site where I wouldn't go after because I can have this. The, the site between 20 and 21 is beautiful. I can go 1, 2, 3 right here. I could also get right in front of 22 and get in here for a couple right in this spot here. So anywhere you see teeth that are a little closer together, it's okay to skip that site and get involved here. Now, plenty of room, plenty of opportunity to osteoperforate him. If we were looking at this x-ray planning TAD placement, the temporary anchorage devices could be put in multiple areas in each arch. And so we would have opportunity to do lots of micro osteoperforations. Just to give you an idea what this case looks like on the ClinCheck, and when we're doing Invisalign, we get the opportunity to open up the virtual model. So we may as well look at the virtual model for this case just to see where we are and get an idea of what um, was involved. So here you have the upper arch looking like this. We're going to press play. This will walk you through the count. So it gives you an idea of the aligner count. It took 33 aligners. And so if we have 33 aligners and we're wearing them, for two week intervals, then what would happen is it would take about 17 months. Uh, a case like this might end up with four to six refinement aligners. So we could kind of round it off at about an 18 to 20 month traditional time frame. And if we were going to do 18 months of orthodontics with Invisalign and move all these teeth here, uh, we would also show you the lower to see where this is going. We'll press play, let those teeth uh, expand and procline out. What you're watching is an amount of tooth movement for 28 teeth that doesn't involve any IPR. Um, some of the IPR, some of the cases with Invisalign or clear aligners are done with IPR. But this is a young, healthy individual that just has a lot of collapse. Uh, and all of these teeth can be moved where they uh, belong without the, the use of any IPR. So this case was treated with just aligner alone therapy, one to the next. And the, the case, which should have run about an 18-month time frame, wearing the aligners at two-week intervals, would have been a nice case. However, with the micro perforation technique, he was able to use the aligners at a nine and eight-day change. Uh, we didn't quite go to seven days on him. One week was a little heroic. This was one of the early cases that we treated. So we went to the uh, nine-day change for him. And on some of the aligners, we were doing eight-day changes. So we've got a, a result that shows a full resolution of the malocclusion. We have a proper arch form, a proper arch width, some very nice buccal lingual inclination back there. We've got an overbite, an overjet. We have a canine guided and protected occlusion. We have intercuspation without interference. So the credentials should be there when we're done with the case. And of course, the red dots are attachments. If, you, if you're familiar with clear aligners, you're getting some attachments to, to treat that case. So we'd love to be able to do that. And if we could do it in 18 months or less, that would be wonderful. And this is what the first aligner looks like. So when Andrew comes in and he receives his first aligner, we're going to put that on and take a picture of it to kind of see what it looks like. The aligners are numbered, so you can always see here it is 01. And then obviously it fits all the little nooks and crannies. These were made by PVS Impression. So PVS Impression delivered a nicely fitting first upper and first lower aligner. And then it was time to do some perforations. And what I did was I used the Invisalign sheet. You know, this is a sheet that comes through Invisalign. And I put all the red dots on here based on the x-ray. You know, where could I go at and where did I feel I could get? If the Panorex wasn't enough, I took a PA. If I took a PA and it confirmed that I could do it, I ended up circling it. So what you're seeing is all the red dots I thought the Panorex would allow for. And then I went and I started circling the ones that could be done after taking some PAs just to make sure. The depth is all recorded here. So the four millimeters, three millimeters, three millimeters, and four millimeters, you can see some of them were at two. The idea here was 18 upper sites and 13 lower sites. So with 18 upper and 13 lower, we did 31 sites, and then he was given the, the Tylenol post-treatment. This is what it looked like. So the, 
the beauty of having this tooth number seven so far back, I can actually use that as a perforation site. So I had room to perforate in here without reaching number seven. We got a lot of sites back here too in the molar areas. So we had premolar and molar opportunities. All the little dots that you see are areas where we perforated. So in total, 31 sites for Andrew. And then the right, it looks like this. We're able to get between the molars over here. And this is what it looks like immediate post-op. So it's like a minute after doing them. By the time the patient leaves the office, the red dots are gone. So here you have the perforations. Now by the time you start moving along, you're on a liner number seven. Obviously with a nine day change, you're in your second month of movement here. And a liner number seven, the upper arch is starting to get some room between six and eight. And then the lower arch is gonna show you a liner number seven. And again, a nicely fitting aligner means nice tracking. And then of course, it's gonna be time for another propel site. So at that point, we get into another round. I'm gonna do 17 and 12. So Basically, the second round is another 29 sites. So we went from 31 sites to 29 sites, almost an equal round in that next round. So similar sites, similar deaths, a total of 29 sites for the second round. And again, Tylenol afterwards. Cooking along here at a liner 17, tooth number seven starting to show up. So we start getting a view of that tooth where obviously we're expanding and we're moving all the teeth a little bit wider, fit them all in. Here's a liner 17. So it's a nicely fitting upper aligner. Number 17 on the lower, very nicely fitting lower aligner. And then of course, if it looks good, it fits nice where we've got nice tracking. We did a third round. He's one of the few cases in the last five years that have had a third round, okay? So it's rare to have a case this severe. And so this is the kind of a complex case that I would do three rounds on. Anything that's mild to moderate gets one to two rounds of perforations. The, the case like this where you see a collapsed bite and you're going to move all 28 teeth and rotate and expand your molars, you might want to get involved with the third round. But the third round is eight and eight. So if you take a look here, eight upper perforations, eight lower perforations, which is common. As you're going through the case, more and more teeth are closer to where they belong. So you, you have a little less movement as you're fading through. So by the time I got to the third round here, eight and eight, 16 perforations in total was enough to carry him through the rest of the case. And then of course we had 33 aligners to treat the case. Normally an 18 to 19 month time frame is appropriate because a few refinement aligners are, are usually indicated. And this case was treated in, in 10.5 months. So with a nine day change, some of the eight day changes in there to test the comfort level of the aligner, we had a, a 10 and a half month treatment time to get him to here. So the 33rd aligner was the last one in the series. And when you get the 33rd aligner to fit and look that good, you know you're in pretty good shape. So obviously we could tell you that the patient was very compliant because Invisalign, uh, clear aligner therapy is gonna work well if it's in the mouth. If it's not in the mouth, you can, rec you can rest, be rest assured you're gonna get trouble with the tracking. So here's the lower 33rd aligner in a very nice arch form, very nice arch width. You got all your teeth lined up. And by the time you're done, you'll have that crossbite of number seven corrected. You'll also have a um, class one occlusion with posterior intercuspation without interference. So the difference between the two slides here is on the right side, he has interferences with the occlusion being marked and him sliding in both sides, he'll pick up all kinds of interferences. Whereas when we're done with the case, both sides will be non-interfering. So we would have intercuspation without interference throughout the posterior. And the reason all of that is checked over time is so that we can provide equilibration should it be necessary. But since this case didn't receive any equilibration, uh, we will let you know that no equilibration was done. The good news is that we can expand and rotate the molars out. So the interesting thing about uh, using the Invisalign is that the distance between these two teeth over here, numbers three and 14 began at 33, and now at the end we're at four, um, 39 to 40. So about a six, maybe seven millimeter molar, first molar rotation and expansion to deliver a nice proper arch form and arch width to get these teeth in place. And then of course, if you're looking at the mid-palatal suture, it began like a hockey stick and that little bit of a curve is now straightening out now that we've gotten all that nice alveolar bone remodeling to take place. We've got a nice broad wide arch in both. The lower, first molars are rotated out again. Again, we're rotating all the teeth out, we're uprighting all the teeth. So we're getting rotation, we're getting all these nice movements that we'd like to find in a beautiful arch form and a beautiful arch width. And once we get to that point, we can recognize, ooh, look, that's a nice wide arch. 
instead of having these premolars and molars at a depth or a distance that's kind of close to each other, we get a nice result where we have a beautiful home for the tongue. And uh, it's nice for the tongue to have a full home if, if, that's, if it's not on your radar yet. What kind of tongue home do you have or what size home does the tongue have? You might want to start looking into that a little bit. It is, turns out it's important for the tongue to have a full home. But at any rate, this is what he looks like after 10 and a half months of clear aligner therapy with Invisalign and the Propel being used for the micro perforations. Again, three rounds. The first round was 31 sites, 18 and 13. The second round was 29 sites, 17 and 12, and then eight and eight. And altogether having 10 and a half months of treatment, that's a very nice service to be able to deliver an arch form, an arch width, a beautiful occlusion without equilibration, and also have three years to show for it. This case was treated uh, in 2011 to 12, and uh, now we're approaching the four-year mark, but the, the case is now three solid years past treatment and going on its fourth soon. So you have a happy kid. You know, he's able to have his midline back. We can take eight and nine and slide them across, bring seven into play. He's got a full smile, and he's very happy to have done his treatment in 10 and a half months, as opposed to taking a 17 or 18, maybe 19-month path to get this case treated. So we'll have a little more fun. So if that wasn't collapsed enough for you, we'll show you another one. This is a nice case. So we meet Chavez. He comes in as a 17, almost 18-year-old uh, high school senior and uh, not interested in wearing braces. And of course, we're going to find narrow and collapsed and deep bite and all the good stuff in there. He's got a little bit of overjet too. So you could just you know, use your imagination to pretend there's a little overjet there. And then again, similar omega-shaped arch, okay? The 2 and 15 are kicked out a bit. Then we start to curve our way in. We're very narrow through the middle teeth and then a little crowding up front with a little protrusive for 8 and 9. And then, of course, a class 1 malocclusion on both sides. He does have interferences. He's got an awful occlusion. Here, what you're recognizing is a little more collapse there because certainly you're about to see there's a lower premolar kind of squeezed into the middle there. And it's kind of sitting towards the tongue. So we've got this lovely tooth number 29 in here. And we have a 17-year-old who's not interested in wearing braces to senior year of high school. Of course, we're going to talk to him and the parents about the opportunity to use clear aligners to fix this case. And again, being that he was a couple of months away from 18 uh, and still considered a minor, we have the full consultation with the parent about the Propel technique. So senior year, possibility of leaving for college. We wanted to get this case treated in a short amount of time. I'm thinking about 10 to 12 months. And normally, if I were to use clear aligners on something like this, it might take 16 to 17, maybe 18 if you throw a little compliance into the mix. So right away, we discussed the possibility of accelerating our orthodontic technique with the micro perforations and both you know, parents and him willing to try it. So that's an interesting tooth. Um, those of you who know me, understand, or know that I do, I do not extract any permanent teeth. So I, all of my treatment is non-extraction, and most of my treatment is little to no IPR. This is a second case where no IPR will be used, and we're not going to extract that tooth either. It's a perfectly healthy tooth that just needs a little help getting to where it belongs. So in order for me to build an aligner around it, I just need a good impression. And if you can impression the lingual surface, because the most important part of this uh, case is to capture underneath that tooth for the aligner to be able to lift it in. I need an impression of that so that I can then make a clint check that shows that whole tooth in it. So if we get the impression, we would expect to find it in the clint check. If it's in the clint check, the aligner will be built around it. And then the final step would be just teaching the patient how to put it on. So we may as well go right to the money shot. And I know you want to see that tooth. Well, there it is. So we got to get underneath it. And we did the impression got in there and got the border of the tissue, so now I have my ClinCheck showing me that full lingual surface, and that's the most important part of that tooth to be able to carry it into the arch as we, as we make our movements. So we've got this upper arch that looks like this, and obviously if we're narrow and we're protrusive, we're just going to do the opposite to solve it. We'll make him wider and retract 8 and 9 a little bit. So we can make him wider, we can retract 8 and 9 a fraction to cut into that little bit of overjet he's got and give him a proper arch form with a proper arch width. That's a nice place to be. The lower is a little more fun, a little more interesting case. It does have a program time of 36 aligners, and 36 aligners would normally take 18 months. But now you recognize there's no IPR on the screen. It's not an IPR case. I would prefer to treat with as little IPR as possible. And so we're going to take this case and put it here. So 
this patient would normally wear 36 aligners at two-week intervals and take 18 months plus a little refinement. Because if you go to 36 and he's a little sloppy here and there, you maybe have a tiny compliance issue, you're going to want to go ahead and make a few refinement aligners. So even if you make four, 40 aligners would be 20 months. And the, the good news about this case, utilizing the Propel, it was treated a little bit later. So we, we treated him just a couple of years ago. So at that point, we were down to the seven-day wear time. So this is a case that wore the aligners one per week. So I consider this a severe malocclusion. And a severe malocclusion, we can wear the aligners with a Propel technique once per week and deliver a result that's very nice for our patients. So we're going to watch that tooth follow along now. This is the first aligner. And so the first aligner, all we had to do is teach him how to put it on. So in a case like this, we don't use the traditional pattern of pushing the front on first. We actually go for that tooth first. So the aligner has to be brought in and pushed under that tooth and then dragged over the buckle. So once we teach him to put it on, we're in great shape. So there's the first one, and here comes your Propel. So same thing, we're going to be looking to do at least 12, and I, and I know this was about 15. So 15 perforations per arch at the first round, and now we've got all our little perforations in there. The aligner fit is looking good, and he's going to take his two Tylenol, and then we're going to move along. This is the fourth aligner, just a little progress. Aligner number four is looking good. Aligner number eight, we're going to get involved with the second round of Propel. By aligner 17, I had a slight advantage in this case. I had an 18-year-old who needed his wisdom teeth out. So you could imagine, with two rounds of Propel up to this point, I used the wisdom teeth extraction as my third round of the Propel because when, in taking out four wisdom teeth, it creates a nice wound, and that wound can be measured all the way along the first two molars, and that's really where I needed significant control. So in order to accelerate this case, I just incorporated the wisdom tooth extraction right into this dead middle of it. That aligner 17, he showed up at the oral surgeon's office. They went in and surgically removed his impacted wisdom teeth, and he put his aligners on, and he walked out of the office. Of course, he's going to look like a chipmunk for a few days, but the aligners can still be on your teeth when you're doing that. So now, by the time we get to 29, you can see 29, we're getting close to 36, and here we are. So it's a still a very nicely fitting tooth. So we're cooking right along. And the after effects are, we've got a broad, wide arch. We've got a beautiful intercuspation on both sides. He's got a very nice canine-protected occlusion. And now you've got this. So the upper wasn't 36 aligners. The upper was probably 14 or 15 aligners to get to this point. So you've got a broad, wide arch. You've got all of the teeth on top in place. And now you've got a wide open palate so the tongue can have a nice home. And then you've got a lower arch that looks like this. So this is what it looks like after the 33 aligners, or 36 aligners on the lower, excuse me. And now you can appreciate the bit of expansion that he received. And so to take this arch to this arch is a lot of dento-alveolar movement. And so all of that dento-alveolar change, thanks to the aligners and also the Propel, delivers a beautiful occlusion. And if you want to study those pictures closely for a moment, I'll leave them up. The entire alveolus expands, so you get a full shift of the dentoalveolar complex so that the patient on the right side of the screen not only has a beautiful occlusion and all of the teeth upright and set it, the massive foundation is there, and you have a narrow foundation here, and you have a massive foundation here. So utilizing the clear aligners in a manner in which expansion is indicated and also uh, utilizing the Propel to shorten the treatment time, you can have a case like this treated in 10 and a half months. And so this is a 10 and a half month opportunity for an 18 year old to get in and out of orthodontics without having to take anything to college and be done with a, you know, a beautiful occlusion, all of the teeth with no IPR. Now, this case was not treated with any IPR. So here he is at the end of the treatment. And the idea here is that the microosteo perforations can be a part of comprehensive care. You know, regardless of the orthodontic technique, certainly these cases were treated with clear aligners and I tend to use the microosteo perforation more with clear aligners than I do with brackets and wires, but I know there are other speakers that use more with the braces, so you have an opportunity to learn more uh, after today. But when we develop a full smile with the clear aligners, and we get it done in 10 and a half months, you've really done a service, and it changes how this patient looks altogether. Now, when he comes back for um, a six-month retainer check, he's wearing his Obviously, he's wearing his clear aligner retainer every night to sleep. 
and all of a sudden he's got a little different style hair, he's got a little different facial hair going on. Of course, at this point, my staff is tripping over each other, trying to fight over who's going to get the camera first to take his picture. But I do want to show you a little bit of a change, and that when, when we went ahead and developed that full arch, if we give him a full amount of expansion and a full development of the upper arch and lower arch, and guide all 28 teeth where they belong, provide a proper home for the tongue, do so in a 10 month time frame is a, is a bonus. But the idea is here you can see all of the facial features change. And this is a case that only had clear aligner therapy. Okay? So this is a 10 month Invisalign case utilizing the micro osteo perforations of Propel to be able to deliver a beautiful occlusion and beautiful facial aesthetics afterwards. He no longer has the overclosed or collapsed VDO with the eversion and lower lip rolling out, producing a right angle here. Now he's got beautiful, soft, subtle curve, and that comes from being at the proper VDO. So uprighting and establishing a, a perfect occlusion involves also changing or increasing the VDO to be appropriate. And now you have a, a really nice, beautiful profile as well as facial features that are developed fully from a comprehensive orthodontic technique. So my uh, experience is mostly using the uh, Propel device, the micro perforations, uh, throughout the entire arch to gain an entirely shorter treatment time. I use it more rarely to go after like one tougher tooth, but it's a, that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do also. And I tend to use it more for clear liners than I do for brackets and wires. But I would encourage you to take some other webinars and look into the uh, Propel website because there, there are a lot of speakers using this more with braces and uh, with brackets and wires. It's equally as effective at saving you lots of time. I put together this little chart just to kind of summarize what I do with it, and it can certainly vary. I wouldn't consider this carved in stone. This is more of a five-year recording of what I've been doing with it. So to give you an idea of how this chart works, uh, over the five years, I started to identify case time frames. And if, if something was about nine months, I was calling it my, mild case. But moderate was like a 10 to 15, and severe was 16 to 24. And if those time frames, you know, are kind of isolated into mild, moderate, severe. What I was looking at them was how many rounds would I do for the mops? And so if I had a mild case, one round would be enough. You know, I could go ahead and do eight to ten mops per arch and change the aligners at a five-day interval. So the more mild the case, the quicker you can turn over the aligners. And so having a five-day change on an aligner is pretty quick. A nine-month case can be cut down to almost one-third of its time. And you might be able to treat that case in three to four months. Now the, the increase in time or severity of the case, we get into a moderate case that might normally take around a year or a little more than a year. I might increase the number of mops per arch, go up to 10 to 12, okay, in the first round, and I might go with a seven day aligner change. And then for the second round, about 10 to 12 weeks later, four to six, you know, roughly in half. If you take the first round and cut it in half, now you're still maintaining your seven day aligner change, okay? A severe case, kind of like the two you saw tonight, where normally they would be somewhere between 16 and 24 months. I might try to look for a dozen at, at minimum and go up to 18 of those mops per arch, and I might be more like a nine-day change. So, you know, nine is very nice. I try to base it on two things. If we go ahead with nine days and the patient has great compliance, there should be no issue, you might even get to eight and seven. If it, with, because with clear aligners, you have to worry a little bit about the compliance. It's not just a slam dunk at seven days. So there are patients who wear the aligners beautifully, and then they are seven days. So the nine-day change down here can easily be a seven, as long as you have the compliance. And compliance means 22 hours a day. So we want to make sure the nine I put here represents a, a reasonable compliant patient, and they might give you 20 to 22. If you know your patient's going to deliver 22 hours, you can go to seven. You'll be able to get seven-day changes on, on this type of a scheme. So if I give them 12 to 18 in the first round for a severe case, when we get to 10 to 12 weeks out, that second round of MOP at 10 to 12 weeks out, I'll cut it back a little bit. I might do 10 to 12. That third round might be six to 10 in the arch. And so with each round, the number of MOPs is diminishing. The time interval is always 10 to 12 weeks apart. Again. The five-day change for a mild case, the seven-day change for a moderate case, very simple to follow. The nine-day for a severe, you're just looking to have compliance. If you've got really exceptional compliance, you could drop that to seven as well. So now, this chart I'm going to leave up on the screen for a little bit in case people want to kind of scribble that down. Again, that's me putting together 
uh, like the majority of the bell curve, so to speak, of the last five years of the patients that I've uh, kind of played with the microosteoperforations with. What I'm going to do is open up the questions here because we have a little more time left to handle some of the questions. So let's see what we've got for questions and we'll go through them one by one here. Okay, so now, all right, what's your criteria to treat? So everyone difficult cases. So, you know, the idea is the, um, the criteria, the, the gentleman I just showed you was 17 years, 10 months. You know, 18 years old, I'd like to have someone who's not a minor. I, I chose him because the, the parents were there. We had a good conversation. They, they were, you know, all into it. I haven't gone under that age. 17, 10, 17 years, 10 months is the youngest. I don't think I would look to be in a 17-year-old, really. I'd prefer 18 and older. But um, as far as criteria to treat, using microosteoperforations is really just an adjunct to be able to have better bone remodeling and then also better tooth tracking a shorter treatment time. And if we're looking to save 50% of the treatment time, then this is a good choice for any patient. Uh, I don't, no one really, let's say, has to have it in order to treat the case. It doesn't make or break whether or not you can do the orthodontics. But I do offer it to patients as a way to sh reduce their treatment time. Then it becomes a personal choice. So in my hands, I'm kind of a, I'm a light pusher, not a heavy pusher. So I would talk about the orthodontic technique that's available to them, an estimate in time frame, and then I would introduce them to a way to you know, offer shorter treatment time. And if the patient has interest, we go into the full conversation on how do we save them about half of the time of treatment. And if they're agreeable, we do it. If they're not, we move into the orthodontics without it. So it's not for everyone. Some patients are, can't wait to have a reduced treatment time, so we go you know, right ahead and do it. I see the next question, it's important to go over. Invisalign just released last week uh, an interval of one week changes. And so the, um, the one week changes on the aligners are built on a significant amount of research that Invisalign just did. And the idea there is that most of that is related to that mild to moderate category. So when you're talking about mild to moderate type of treatment, you can use an aligner at seven day intervals and their research shows very nice tracking. So knowing that now, which is just last week's information, uh, the idea would be if I'm going to introduce Propel, well now obviously seven days is the full protocol for an aligner in a mild case. I've already been at five, so I would be looking for three to four days because you should be able to save half the treatment time. So if you're dealing with a mild to moderate case that you can use Invisalign on a weekly basis now, you would be looking for three to four day changes with Propel. A severe case is still going to be used at two weeks. The, the two gentlemen I just showed you are treated with two-week aligner changes. They wouldn't qualify for treating those two cases with a one-week change, and I think you can understand why. They're a little more of the outlier type of case. But when you take a look at those cases, a two-week change time, seven days is an easy way to change those, and that's why those cases were treated in 10 and 10 and a half months. All right, so now. The um, next question, are you concerned with recession for these expansion or labialized cases? And the question is no. In fact, um, for the last 13 years, I've been doing that level of expansion for all of the narrow and collapsed cases. In fact, I'm concerned with, it, I'm concerned with recession leaving the teeth like that. Most of the recession and abfractions that we notice on the buccal areas of the teeth are with the teeth leaning in and facing the tongue. And so because of the collapse and the horizontal forces that are placed on the teeth, we tend to get recessions, clefting, and abfractions. Uprighting the teeth and delivering a vertical force instead of a horizontal force improves the occlusion. And so the concern for recession comes from the teeth leaning towards the tongue and not when they're upright. So instantly I look to solve the malocclusion. The patients that come in with recession and abfraction, even if there is clefting, get expanded and uprighted. And then not only does the gum tissue heal, that gum tissue climbs up the teeth. And in, in multiple forums, I've presented those cases to show how uh, gingival tissue, clefting heals, recession will heal, and abfraction stop dead in their tracks just by uprighting the teeth and changing the horizontal force that they're under to vertical. And that's all based on occlusal principles that um, you know, I think most of them originated with Dr. Pete Dawson, uh, early 1970s when he started outlining occlusal traumatism and how horizontal forces led to occlusal traumatism, which had destructive properties uh, for the teeth, the gum, and the bone, and joint joint muscles also. So I love to upright the teeth into a position where they have an opportunity for vertical force, and it tends to help all of the areas of the gum tissue. 
All right, so now, if a case requires the use of class two elastics, does the AP correction with elastics lag behind? If so, do you hold the patient in the last tray and continue to use elastics until the desired over jet is reached? So, the um, that's a great question. It's a little more involved than what we covered tonight. That well, I might have to rely on one of the uh, orthodontists that treat uh, cases with the Propel, and we might have to get back to you with an answer for that one. I'd love to be able to give you a, a solid, straightforward answer. I tend not to use the Propel on the class two elastic cases, so I don't have a, a lot of volume and experience in being able to answer that question for you. If an aligner is not tracking and additional aligners are needed, how do you maintain the high cytokine level until the additional aligners arrive? That's a great question, so I'll answer it. The, let's say you get to the uh, end of the aligners and you want to make more, so you're going to take an impression and then it takes about three to four weeks to get them back. So a way to keep the, the cytokine level high is at the time you're impressioning for refinement or mid-course correction or something like that, what you would do is instruct the patient only to wear them at night. And so in the middle of a case or towards the end of a case when you're making new aligners, the teeth have a lot of mobility. And at that point what happens is the patient leaves the aligners out all day and the teeth shift a little bit because of the mobility. At night you put them on, the aligners go back in at night, there's a lot of pressure on them. So overnight they're moving again. So basically the teeth are kind of bounced a little bit. They get to move during the day, they get reset at night, move during the day, reset at night. It keeps the entire alveolus lit up. So it maintains a very high level because you're not in retention mode. So whenever it comes time to order new aligners, I do not have the patient maintain wearing the same aligner or the last aligner for the entire month, day and night, because that's acting as a retainer and the cells start to clear. So rather than have your last aligner be a retainer and have clearing of histology, when you'd like to maximize the histology, you leave them out during the day, enjoy the days off, put them in at night, they'll be a touch tighter, but not really because these are mobile teeth, but it does trick the cells into thinking we're doing lots of moving still. So eight hours at night and then all the hours in the day off, it makes for excellent maintenance of the level and then you get beautiful mobility. Four weeks later, you're not in a, in a retention mode. So the, I think I covered a couple of these questions, a lot of questions about the seven-day aligners. So the idea is, yeah, with the seven-day aligner changes, those are more for the mild to moderate cases. And so when you're dealing with uh, mild to moderate orthodontic cases that are going to be able to use an aligner in seven days, you would employ the same exact microosteoperforation technique, but now you'd be looking to make them a three or four-day aligner change because cutting the time in half is a standard. If you're delivering a nice round of Propel, or microosteoperforation in each arch, you should be able to have a 50% reduction in treatment time and still have beautiful tracking. The cases that I treat with the microosteoperforation have the best tracking. And so those are the cases that require a little to no refinement. Uh, you saw the two cases tonight were treated without refinement. Those two cases were photographed at the final aligner in the first batch, a 33 for the first gentleman, Andrew, and the second gentleman, Chavez, was at 36. So no refinement needed to take them all the way through to a very nice occlusion. So the idea now is you can have a uh, ability to shorten up the mild and moderate cases even more so. So knowing that aligners can be worn in seven days is an advantage. Now you can treat that case in less time. There were cases already documented where three and four day aligner changes were done for mild type of treatment. So that kind of helps you out a little bit. So now what's the additional charge for treatment? Well. There's, there's a twofold thing here because you have um, an opportunity to charge for your service, so certainly you can add a fee to the procedure. Um, I typically add $500 to the case cost to offer the Propel, and I find that it really comes back m in multiple ways because first of all, I've got a $500 fee for something I'm going to spend 15 minutes on, and then secondly, it's going to shorten my case by half the time. So if I take half of my chair time out of the case by treating it in 10 months instead of 18 months or 20 months, I've just increased the profitability of the of the case by reducing the time. So the bottom line is whatever you feel comfortable charging your patients to accelerate their orthodontics. It's a it's a procedure that has you know a lab cost, a hardware cost on some level, and then your time as well. So feel free to 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 do. So now the um, Oh, so please describe your impression technique, uh, how you captured the lingualized bicuspid. So uh, the funny thing is I did heat the tray. Thanks for bringing that up. The question was uh, mentioning about the, the in, 
the plastic trays that are used to take Invisalign impressions are blue and they're perforated, but if you warm it up, you can heat it and just shape it. So I did heat it, I expanded the tray, I shaped it a little bit differently just to be able to make sure it wasn't rubbing on that tooth when I seated the impression. Because if you saw the slide on that impression, it had a full amount of material, PVS material all the way around it. So I like to put heavy body in the tray. So my assistant will load heavy body into the tray and then what I would do is um, place the light body on top of it. So heavy body goes in the tray, it fills the tray about halfway. I take the light body and I squirt another layer on top of the heavy body. On a case like that where I need to capture that one tooth, I'm going to take that light body and also syringe it around that one tooth and then place the tread right over the arch. And it's going to take a nice impression. So basically heating the tray can shape it a little bit. Heavy body with light body over it and placing a little light body right around that one individual tooth would be great. Sometimes for cases that have severe lower crowding, I might even express some light body right over the teeth and let it just run right down the teeth and then take that heavy body, light body tray mix and put it over it. All right, so now, so now a question about the abfractions. Would abfractions best be watched to see if tissue covers them before considering bonding? Anytime I'm treating a case that has clefting, recession, and abfraction, um, we're going to take them through the orthodontics first and stabilizing the occlusion makes an improvement to the tissue. The periodontal procedures are usually uh, after orthodontics unless there's a, a defect that um, involves a loss of attachment completely uh, and then they need the periodontist first. So basically the, um, the idea would be finish up the orthodontics. I do like about six months of retention first because before considering any type of tissue work or abfraction bonding, I like six months of stability. Let the histology clear. Let the teeth tighten. When the mobility is gone, reject the occlusion. Any type of minimal equilibration that could be done to help a patient is, is nice. And then once you've done any little final equilibrations if necessary and you have a, a set of teeth that are no longer mobile, all of the histology has been cleared and the mobility is gone that you generated from the ortho, now you can re-photograph and re-measure and see what level of recession, clefting, and abfraction is still there. Abfractions, I have two reasons to fill them after orthodontics. One of them would be aesthetics. If they're in the patient's smile line and they're tired of seeing that, I can fill it. The second would be sensitivity. If the abfractive area has you know, hot or cold sensitivity or if the sweet gets in there and gives the patient this thing, you certainly could fill that in. The, um, the idea behind filling the abfractions is over the last 10 years, I've been filling them less and less and leaving them alone. Um, after orthodontics, I find the abfractions not to have sensitivity, and most of them aren't involved in the smile line. So I would say today, I fill much less of the abfractive lesions than I used to, and I only reserve filling them for the patients who have sensitivity and or a cosmetic issue with it being in their smile line. The um, question here is about uh, using the mop on the palate and when would be a clinical indication for doing that. Uh, thanks for asking that question. That case is going to be covered in the February uh, lecture, but I'll give you an idea. Um, I love to use the microosteal perforation on the palate when I'm opening up premolar spaces. And so uh, for patients who had uh, upper premolars or all four, all four premolars extracted, if we're going to be taking them through a premolar um, reconstructive case where we're going to develop the entire arch form and the arch width and give them back a full occlusion and add back those premolars as implants. Well, then I like to microosteal perforate the palate right around where those premolars are going to go. So upper premolar extraction sites open up beautifully and I use the microosteal perforations on the palate as well. So I'll go from the buccal and the lingual and palatal and buccal perforations around those premolar sites help them open up beautifully and uh, when we get to the February course we're going to show you how to give back two upper premolars to someone who had them removed at a young age and uh, give them back a better and healthier and stable occlusion. All right, so uh, someone wanted to know about the retention. Um, since the two cases you witnessed were both clear aligners, I stick with the clear aligner retention method, which would mean uh, they were treated with Invisalign. Invisalign's retainer is called Vivera. And so I give the patients Vivera. The retention philosophy uh, is that we wear retainers full time for six months so that all of the cytokine can clear. It takes about six months for all of the histology to clear. And that's when really the bone remodeling is completed and then you have the tightening of the teeth. So I like full-time retainer wear for the first six months. Then after that we go to bedtime only. 
that's the point where we start really checking the occlusion and we'll mark it and look for any type of interferences. And at that point, if you, if you find a little interference, you want to do a tiny equilibration, go ahead. The two cases I showed today did not receive any equilibration at the six month mark. Those cases are um, almost four years and almost, almost coming up on two years now post-treatment um, with teeth that are, have no mobility and also require uh, no equilibration. So now, the um, question here is about uh, amazing that you see gingival improvements even with thin biotype anywhere we can see that. Yeah, those are all recorded webinars. I have multiple recorded webinars through Align Technology and I know those are all on their website so they're all accessible. Uh, mostly I show them anywhere I lecture too. So um, if anybody would like to see cases that show gingival improvements, periodontal improvements, periodontal healing, clefting, disappearing, tissue climbing back up teeth, covering up areas that it wasn't before. Uh, it's all about improving the occlusion. And so patients that have gingival buckle, mostly buckle, gingival recession, um, almost always have lingually inclined teeth under horizontal force. It's a function of malocclusion. And so if you've got a malocclusion where horizontal forces are causing that trouble, you want to solve the cause of it by uprighting those teeth and getting them back into a full vertical force position. And the posterior teeth are meant to be in a full uh, vertical position. And so uh, the idea is if we can get the posterior teeth set up with vertical force on them, not horizontal force, so if we can get them set up that have, that where they have intercuspation without interference, all of the tissue heals and it isn't a function of the thin biotype. Uh, thin or thick biotype, you can expand any patient to positions where they belong. And so I, I will take any collapsed patient lingually and move them out and upright basically because that's where the teeth belong and it also delivers a beautiful occlusion with posterior intercuspation without interference. And those are recorded in webinars uh, throughout Invisalign's uh, website. Some of them are periodontal improvements, some of them are expansion techniques. Uh, they have different titles, but if you look for my name in the Invisalign site, it'll show you uh, all the different periodontal cases that we've treated over the years. On top of that, we can grow bone too. Uh, more recently, I've been showing the cases where we're growing the bone back. So I have patients who we've treated with Invisalign that have had 90% bone loss. I'll say it again to be clear, 90% bone loss. And uh, that would mean on the lower incisors having about a millimeter or two of bone. And we've managed to triple that, get the patients up to anywhere from four to five, even six millimeters of bone around those teeth by treating and stabilizing the malocclusion. So Invisalign can not only help with your gum improvements, it'll also help you grow the bone back around some of those teeth. Uh, those, those are also available to see as well. I believe I presented some of those at last year's summit. So yeah, the, the reference for looking for other cases. I know they're out there. And then of course, just uh, look me up and come see me. I'll show you more cases. So I'm running out of time here. So I appreciate all your questions. And so uh, one, of, oh, one of the last ones I should answer here, do you use the 3D ClinCheck or any special attachments to get these great results? Um, yes, of course, the, the ClinCheck is a very valuable tool in setting up these cases properly and it doesn't happen by magic. You know, as much as I love clear aligners and I treat cases that have sev the severest of malocclusions with clear aligners, Invisalign, as beautiful as that product is, they don't really dictate that treatment plan. I build that. And so that comes from my philosophy and my uh, treatment form and preferences that I send them and then I get those clinch checks back that way. So the idea is I do a lot of teaching for Invisalign to share my techniques with uh, other doctors who are interested in learning how to treat patients they have like that. In general my philosophy is I am non-extraction and, and little to no IPR. And so in that manner I do get to teach my technique. The um, attachments luckily are software driven and so as soon as my techniques are plugged into the computer, the attachments know, the, atta the computer knows what types of movements I'm asking for, whether it's intrusion, extrusion, expansion, tipping, rotation, translation, all of that's factored in so the attachments are done automatically. So the, the one item that I do not ask for or dictate are the attachments. The software does place all of the attachments and so, um, and that's a beautiful thing. So the, that, that takes care of nice stuff. So I hope you enjoyed talking about teeth after having a full day looking at teeth today. And um, again, there's much more information on the Propel website and certainly there's um, a longer list of, of speakers that have lots more uh, experience uh, treating cases that involve brackets and wires. And so um, I have a third part coming up in February and I hope to see you then. I want everybody to have a nice evening. Thank you very much.